five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is Chad Aaron. You're listening to My Alien Life. And I can see them looking at me, but I didn't see their faces. All I saw was the hood. And then I look down the hallway, and here comes a tall woman, a tall white uh, alien. She wore a two-piece. It was a tan two-piece, one you know, covering her top part, the other one like kind of like a mini skirt, a two-piece. And she was about seven feet tall. She had no hair. She had big almond eyes, and, and she was pretty. She was really a, a beautiful woman. And she walked up to me, and then she looked at me, and I saw her face real well. Now, that's that's one that looked me right in the face. That's the only one on that ship that looked me dead in the face. They're here to watch over us. They're here. Some of them have actually been involved in manipulating our DNA. There's some manipulation going on to this day. Still, when I had a an implant and I, I took it out, I put it under a microscope, it looked like brain neurons. My Alien Life is recorded live from atop the northern Rocky Mountains and is available on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and everywhere fine podcasts are found. My website is at www.myalienlifepodcast.com. There you will find my email address, all previously recorded shows, and more. I am Cameron Brower. This is My Alien Life, and the podcast starts right now. My Alien Life Podcast. Yes, I know it said Cameron Brower, and yeah, this is Cameron Logan. People had a hard time with the name Brower. It came out Bowser, Bauer, whatever, and this this is kind of a throwback night because, um, yeah, Dave Emmons is here tonight. We're going to we're gonna rehash some ghost stories, or, or rather alien stories, that were extremely interesting. And, and we have the doctor of diagnosis, Cassidy Lightwing. He's at the helm. Cass, I think it's interesting that, okay. uh, that you can give a unique perspective and I, of course, think it's interesting, but I'm hoping our listeners also appreciate your perspective as well as Dave. And by the way, how are you? It's, it's, it's Wednesday. It's good. Just FYI, if, if everybody thought that uh, Neil Young was going to be with us, no, he's no longer with Spotify. So Neil's not going to be here with us tonight. That would have been cool. I agree. What would you ask Neil Young? Actually, I, I love Canadians. So um, one of these nights, I got a couple Canadians that have been kind of waiting around and I feel bad. I haven't had them. I've been on their podcast. They haven't been on mine. So, um, yeah, so I'll have them instead of Neil Young, but, uh, I would have loved to love to, um, been a member of Crosby stills, Nash and Young, Logan or whatever. That would have been fun. I'd listen. (laughs) That's crazy times. I mean, they lived, what's the Valley they lived in. I can't even think of it in in California. Um, the Eagles live there. Um, San Fernando Valley. No, Jackson Brown lived there. Look that up. The Valley. It's a. It's a. Uh, there's a doc on Netflix about it right now. It's fantastic. Anyway, all these people lived in um, this valley, and uh, real small valley, and all these musicians and um, super cool community. You know, you'd like go to the grocery store, a little grocery store, and run into Don Henley. You know, or Jackson Brown, or Glenn Fry, or the Beach Boys live there. So that would be cool. <laughs> yeah. So that was really cool. And now I'm mentioning this documentary. I can't even remember what the Valley is called. Um, can, I couldn't find it on Google right away either. Could you Google like uh, Eagles 
Home Valley, Jackson Brown, something like that. I don't know what it was. I know we're getting off topic, but that's kind of what we do. Um, anyway, yeah, that was a huge blow today. I'm a big Neil Young fan. Um, honestly, I don't watch a lot of po- or listen to a lot of podcasts because I'm doing this one, but um, so I, I don't listen to Joe Rogan. I don't. I listen to a lot of um, UFO guys out there, and I'm not going to name any, but I don't want to leave anybody out. But there's a few that I listen to, and um, fortunately, there's with limited time, it's not like I can listen to you know hours and hours of podcasts, you know, all week long. Do you listen to podcasts, Cass? Some. I don't have a whole lot of time. I have to split it between current events and philosophy and science and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I listen to clips from Joe Rogan. Um, I do. I, I listen to Tim Cast. Um, right. Yeah. You know, I Alec Baldwin's podcast. I would listen to that just because he has these huge guests and like in the music industry, which I really dig. And um, so I listen to that and um, some big ones, you know, like um, Muse and um, Tom from Radiohead and Tom York. People like Ooh, that. Yeah. Elvis Costello. I mentioned this before. Seems like I talk about the same thing every podcast. But um anyway, I you know, I had some some music inspirations and I heroes really that I gotta have, you know, on my other podcast inside the guest studio. And these are guys that I said yes immediately. I have no idea why. You know, it's not like I had a lot of podcasts of that type under my belt, but you know, um it was a lot of fun. And, um, I had some, you know, like Jeff Werzig, who's a movie producer and, um, writer, documentarian. He, um, you know, has made some, some dandies and I got to have a couple of my heroes that he did shows or did documentaries about. And, um, it was a thrill. It was a lot of fun. So did you see anything about the Valley? Lots of stuff. Uh, I just want to know what the Valley was called. I can't remember. Anyway, I could found Cumberland Valley Eagles, but I think that's a high school sports team. So, you know, in my estimation, I think in light of the news, um, sounds like uh, we're not quite at war with with Russia yet, but um, that's an interesting place. That's the, my number one place to go in the world right now, unfortunately, is Ukraine. I thought maybe next year, you know, it, it would be be one of those years that that could possibly happen but it doesn't really look like that's going to happen um it'd be really cool and i'd like to go to russia not so much now but um ukraine would be awesome and to the point where you know i i i'm searching for deals on facebook marketplace um here was a guy that had this table i wanted a few several weeks ago and um showed up at his house and i'm like are you from the ukraine and he said yeah and so I uh, ended up talking to this guy for a very, very long time. He's a retired repairman, and um, he's agreed to fix any of my stuff that uh, that I would have, of course, at a, at a fee. But, you know, I can't have um, an immigrant like that who came to America, and blessedly so, because it's a great place to be. And, um, you know, I'm glad he's here, and it's I think it's – an opportunity for me to meet somebody like that, an opportunity for him to to uh, keep living, and hopefully I can bend his ear while he fixes my dishwasher or something. I have no idea. That would be cool. Yeah, there's a bunch of really strange places in Russia that I want to visit as well. Yeah, you know, that's like another cauldrons. thing, you know, and, and just really, you know, Soviet, during Soviet times, things were so different, you know, there. And, and um, you know, it was this war machine, and... Um, you know, they had their space program and all that stuff has fallen to ruins and, 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 and including their, 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 their nuclear power, you know, um, it would be so cool to, to see some of those places go to the exclusion zone. Although that's such a touristy place right now, you know, people go there and, um, I have a story about that and it's going to come out. I'm going to talk about that. I have been to Russia and, um, but it was like for a week and it was a side trip for another trip that I was with when I was young, young with a group. And um, ah. that was in 1989. And so I got the opportunity to, to buzz through there real quick. So it was a whirlwind tour. Um, took a pretty interesting side trip that 
was kind of scary. Um, and I'm not saying that because it was a kind of a scary place, but, but at that time, it was just a really weird place to be. And um, the circumstances and, and how I got there and with who is, is bizarre, but um, I'll talk about that in another show. But Dave Emmons is in the studio tonight, and um, Dave, it's good to talk to you again. I don't even know when the last time I talked to you. We're sort it's, of communicating off and on. You yeah, know. It's been the last couple, it's, I think a couple of years ago. Really? I was on your show. I haven't done uh, a thing since then. Uh, you haven't done anything since no, then? No, have you? Yeah, I've been on the, <laughs> I well, I, I, I've been on one radio station. Uh, I don't. I don't want to mention it because uh, uh, kind of, and now I'm on DNN, uh, Disclosure News Network. Right. Uh, so I'm on that now. And we got an interview tomorrow night that we've been waiting for the last couple of months because my production guy was, uh, he's been having a battle, you know, so, but he's, he's, uh, he's doing fine now, but we just got a little bit behind. Uh, we're having Yuri Geller on tomorrow night. You're kidding. You know, no. okay. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about Yuri wow. Geller because he, Yuri Geller, um, yeah, we, I was just talking to one of my mates about him. Um, we, uh, I don't know. He, Yuri Geller, he put me off and I don't remember. I, he was going to be on and then um, there was some kind of conflict and I just kind of let it go because um, anyway, I just let it go. But he's an interesting guy. Yes, and, he uh, is. And uh, what happened we had him on our show was do, doing a two hour show. He said he gets, uh, I don't know, something like 50 radio w- requests a week. He does. Yeah. And he chose mine cause he said he felt my energy. And I said, wow, that's saying something. I'm you know, feeling said, it. Yeah. And he said that, uh, uh, he actually answered or he, he was psychically reading me on my questions that I would ask. And he, uh, he come across and he said, I know what you're going to ask me next. I said, okay, what? And I said, he said the God in the universe, right? I said, yes. Explain that. So yeah, he, and uh, my, my partner, uh, co-host and uh, production guy, he goes, wow, <laughs> this is, this is crazy. He is, he is really real. Are you um, like, doing audio or and video? Both? No, I'm not doing, you said just audio. No, I'm with Yuri. Oh, is it no, he wouldn't do uh video because he said something about a tv contract a restriction right ah uh, yeah you know he recently got exonerated if you uh t- checked out the cia declassified files that they put out a few mom- uh, months or about a year ago or whatever yeah. uh it says right in there that they basically they were the ones that caused him to be debunked so you know bam exoneration for mr geller right yeah and he's a real person he's 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 peaceful he's a very caring guy I, I got to know the a good side of him. Uh, so I guess he's got a business side, but uh, his business side, he's real friendly. I mean, he met a lot of interesting people. He was friends right. with Michael yeah. Jackson. Yes. And uh, Elvis Presley, he knew him. And just two weeks ago, he had a, a royal, I guess, a ballroom thing at his mu- museum. Yeah, he's and got he, the museum in, in Israel. Yeah. And he, um, you know, he does a lot of Facebook, or not, um, I'm sorry, Instagram live which uh, I watch all those and it, it's interesting. I watch, I guess, you know, I say that I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but I watch a lot of Facebook live and, and Instagram live. I like to see our people out yeah. there. And I yeah. Like we're them. friends on Facebook and he actually yesterday, he, he wants to talk. He usually wants to talk on WhatsApp and you know, that's uh so I give him my phone number. He right. wanted that. Right. So we we're friends. I mean, we're kind of friends just, He's just a, uh, to me, the energy just matched. Uh, am I supposed to be on video or what? No, no, we're just audio tonight, Dave. And and thanks again for being here. I know it was kind of short notice. We, um, I had a, was kind of doing some throwback nights because um, I had some guests that I wanted to repeat with. And the reason so is because um, I'm joined by Cassie Lightwing, who, uh, I don't know if you know who Cassidy Lightwing is, but um, he's a, an extremely unique individual and um, a very intelligent individual. And um, he has some unworldly experiences that um, he can probably relate to yours, Dave. And I give an outer interstellar, interstellar, exp- uh, I don't know, how, how would I even describe the the touch that you put on the show cast, because you, you give a perspective that 
is not of this world. What is your perspective? Kev? It's an out of town point of view. I have to admit. Right. What would you tell Dave? I mean, mm-hmm. how, how would you describe you know, Dave? You and Dave are strangers. So I just want you to kind of let him know what you're, what you're listening to when he's going to describe his experiences and, and what sort of perspective that, uh, and direction you come from. Okay. Well, um, I guess there's no way to to really, you know, do this politely. So I'll just break the ice. Um, I believe that the same people that, uh, are rather related, um, wow. And suddenly the cat's got my tongue. But they, right. I mean, you, you, your perspective is not from this world. And, um, Basically, you've told me many, many times that, that there's a reason that you're here, and we're not going to get deep into that. But um, there's a mission, there's a there's a process that you're you're going through. But I think it's interesting, Dave, that he Cass has. I mean, even 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 the knowledge above and beyond who he is of of sort of our universe and and, and general physics and. And um, and people and 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 aliens and and ghosts and whatever else cryptids he's he's pretty well versed on all of that. So, um, yeah. Dave, go ahead and and I want you to talk about who you are, Dave, and and just kind of briefly um, touch upon your experiences, and and we'll get a little bit deeper into that. But I want to give uh, people who haven't heard you before, and as well as Cassie Lightwing, a little introduction to who you are. And if you please do that, and I'll just go ahead, please. Okay, uh, is, how long is this show? Two hours? <laughs> well, you can go as long as you want. Don't don't worry about it. As soon as I sense, I, I don't, sense I, I don't want to go that long. I want I want I want the cast to get in there too. Yeah, no, um, no, no, no. You, I just want to uh, briefly describe, um, you know, who you are, where you're from, and and we'll kind of go hey. from there. And I'll I'll pick and choose some questions for you guys. I'm uh, from the Midwest. I was in the military, combat veteran of Vietnam. I had top secret security clearance. I got out of that because I didn't like it. Being only 19, turning 20 in the Army, it was too much pressure, military intelligence every week. I didn't like that. I passed a a big test that they had to pass to get into the school at Redstone Arsenal, but I had to get the post chaplain to get me out of the top secret and out of the school. I had an 89% average. That's my military and top secret. Everybody wants to know about top secret, so I'm just telling them that that I did have the top secret in the military and I got out of it. My brother was getting served papers for Vietnam, but we were in the service at the same time. So when he did, I said, I told my old man, the captain, I said, go ahead and, you know, make me a free agent. You know, let me, I'll go to Vietnam. So I got orders for Vietnam the following week and I took his place because brothers didn't have to, uh, you know, go to the same time. So I took his place because his wife was going to have a baby. So I, I figured I'm single. I'll go, I'll go myself. So that's part of my history. Uh, I was uh, uh, involved in business management. I was a supervisor in an oil refinery, made gasoline, and I worked with the Red Cross disaster management. And I saw my first UFO when I was 13 years of age. And I saw a second one when I was 14 years of age with a good buddy of mine. And that was uh, years ago. That was back in 1963. So that's that, out, that outdates all you guys here. So I've had, I've seen six up close UFOs. In my book, I just signed a contract with a publisher last week. And my book should be released in maybe three weeks, something like that. And I can't talk about the title or what it looks like, or I, it's going to have all my experiences in it. It's going to have pictures in it. I had an artist draw some pictures for me from Sweden. Uh, heck of a nice guy, uh, Olaf. Uh, his name's Olaf Rochner or Rockner, however you want to say it. But he's a, a terrific artist. And my publisher is Hangar One Publishing out of uh, Minneapolis. So I'm working with them, giving them a plug too, but I can't plug my book yet until, until it's released. And then I can, I can talk about that. But I've had a lot of, I guess, what you call abduction experiences, a lot of weird abduction experiences. Uh, some of them I thought I was going to be electrocuted. I was shocked almost to the point of not, I, I wasn't able to move. Three times I was shocked by, you know, like a static electricity. And I was, that was, I talked to Dr. David Jacobs about that at a, at a convention one time. And he told me, he said, they were bringing you back when you felt that electricity. I said, oh, really? I said, I thought 
I thought they were taking me. He said, oh, no. He said they were bringing you back. That static electricity, that charge that they, they have on you, that's when you're coming back through the portal, uh, whatever portal they take you through or whether whatever dimension. I've had some, I guess, here lately. They said the older you get, I was told this by MUFON, the older you get, the less experiences you have. That's not necessarily true because I'm finding out no way because in 2020, February 2020, I got a video of a reptilian looking into my trail camera. Uh, Linda Moulton Hall asked me, she said, why did you have a trail camera on your kitchen table? I guess she thought she was going to catch me on that one. I said, I'll tell you why. The night before, all my motion sensors downstairs, and I was sleeping upstairs in a condo, all my motion sensors went off. And they were going off all night long. I said, I, and they always work perfectly. So I knew there was something in my house or walking through or coming up. So I got a picture of three entities, actually. And the one that I'm really trying to get some uh, computer forensic video cleanup on is this uh, reptilian that looks into my camera. You can see its eyes and, and, you know, you can see the side of its jaw undulating from the diodes from the camera. And so, but some people can't see it. Some people can. And it, um, I guess I'm struck with uh, disbelief when people look at the thing and they put it on their big screen and they still can't see the eyes. The eyes are right out there on the left-hand corner. I just went through this with a, with a guy the last couple of days. Uh, Kathy Martin uh, hooked me up with this guy that's supposed to do a 3D uh, sculpture of a reptilian. And I was putting some input into it. Cool. Did you, a, did you say Kathy Morden, Morton or Martin, Kathy Martin, 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 Martin? Martin, okay. That's what yeah. I thought. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so I was, put, and my input was being on this reptilian. They had a 3D guy there, and he was doing the sculpting while I was actually talking. And I said, they said, did it have any uh, scales? I said, no. And they said, that's strange. Most of the people said they had, he had scales. No, they don't. I got the skin right on my camera. It's a it's a green, greenish skin with black bumps. There is no scales. On they, they I don't know. People could have seen one. There's different species of every kind, but this one did not have scales. He was he was smooth skin like a lizard. Take take a look at the you know look up lizards without without scales. There's a lot of them. That's even some of them have some little bit of hair growing on them. That's it's just like a reptilian. It has black stubbly hair on its cheeks. And on its chin, and I, you can see that in the film. You, you look close enough. But I also got a picture of a Michelin man coming up my stairs. A Michelin man. I didn't know what that was until a MUFON investigator told me. I had a good friend of mine in Missouri who was a MUFON field investigator, and he was uh, one of the tops. He's been there a long time. I sent him the films. He called me an hour later. He said, "Dave, that's not a little gray looking in your camera." He said, "That's a reptilian." I said, oh, my God. He said, yeah. And he said, the other thing that's going up your stairs, he said, that's a Michelin man. He said, I'll send you an interview. He said, I've done with a retired colonel in the Air Force that they work with Michelin man. And they have concentric circles around their uniform. That's why they're called Michelin man. Their uniforms have gotcha. circles around them. Yeah. So, and they show up bright white, of course, an infrared camera. So I had the three of them in my condo for three months. My wife was gone to the Philippines for a couple of months to see her first grandchild born, and I didn't go. So I stayed home to take care of things, and that's when it happened. Uh, they, for three months, they were in, this, this, in my condo. I was getting magnetic readings off of my uh, tri-field meter, and I just, it was beyond me that what was going on in this house for three months, it, it, it was scary. And this was like in 2020, February through May of 2020. So you're never too old to be messed with. I my, my wife was in the, in the Philippines at that same time and nothing that interesting happened in my house. Let me, I just want, <laughs> I just want to say that because I was just lonely as hell. And, and um, yeah, Dave, you have a very interesting wife. Um, so what I was going to ask Cass and I always, I've never asked him this before. Had, you know, they do have, there, there are people who, you know, last week was last week we had, we had a guy that had a, an alien on a game cam and, um, which was super interesting, but I don't, 
you know, I've seen I've seen um, artist renditions of Lyrans. I've never seen anybody who actually thought that they had a real picture of one. So that's why are some photogenic and some are not, Cassidy? It has a lot to do with the base technology. Uh, the Lyran technolo- technological base is primarily light and consciousness. So, it, you know, there's plenty of pictures of us around the world. I mean, many of you guys have seen one and you don't even know it. Mm-hmm. It's just that part of the process that we use to travel planets is a consciousness thing. We are born amongst the people that inhabit the world. You know what I mean? So there are, there are several very famous musicians, artists, and whatnot who come from a variety of, uh, of, of sources. And I believe that, that that can lead us into the hybridization con, uh, conversation because you know, hybridization is a very real factor. And yes, yeah, I looked into you a little bit, Mr. Emmons, and that's why I'm like, whoa, I'm nervous. You know, oh, that's, that's don't, don't be that. I've, I've been, I've done a lot of interviews and I, of course I've done two radio shows and this DNN is pretty successful. Uh, we're getting, we're getting, you know, some, there's some really big hits that I didn't think we was going to get. Uh, but our production is like behind time because uh, my buddy and, and the producer guys had some ups and downs uh, in, in health and, but he's, he's back on the road again. Right. So we're getting those, those productions done. I, oh. I, I've just been around, I guess, uh, uh, to conventions and things. I haven't done, um, when I get my book done, when it's done in about three weeks, I, I'll probably go to uh, some conventions, that type of thing, and talk about some of my, my ex- expeditions or whatever. Well, the reason I'm nervous is because you, I've noticed, uh, and just in the information I've been able to find so far, you never allude to exactly which tribe of uh, reptilians you know, you're dealing, you've been dealing with. And that's going to paint a different, uh, I don't know, cadence to the conversation, depending on the answer to that. You see what I mean? I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't study the tribes. I just know that the, I've seen. I've seen one in my bedroom. He's about right. five and a half feet tall, six feet tall, and he looks like a cobra in a face. And they have smooth skin. It's kind of greeny skin. It's not scales. I, maybe there's there's a difference. That gives me a lot of information, sir. Yeah, there's a lot, lot of there's tribes like you said, different species. I didn't see the scales. This was smooth skin right. with black black dots, little bumps all over its body. And its face and its eyes are kind of like ours. It's got eyelashes, and actually they were it's you know they're white pupils, and the center of the eye is actually a gold yellow color. So it's they're a little bit different than us. And this thing had to be tall because he had to bend down sideways to look into the camera, and he knew what he was doing. I mean, he these things are smart. They're not going to give good pictures. Well, yeah, they they came a long way. So it's obviously. I mean, there's technology there. There's um, yeah, th- one of the things that, you know, you describe the smooth skin and, and it, this isn't a theory not smooth, of mine. Not smooth. It's kind of bumpy with a little bump. Right. But I, you know, I always, like I always wondered, you know, in the back of my mind, and I have for a very, very long time, if um, they're more amphibian like, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, some artist renderings and some different things that I've heard kind of pointed me in that direction. But it's just interesting to me that, um, that they would give the smooth skin. I don't know. That kind of well, piqued they my said curiosity. Thousands, yeah, thousands of years ago, actually, there's some scientists who believe we split off from reptilians some millions of years ago, and that they had hair. They and these things have short, stubbly black hair. Uh, I talked to a woman uh, was on Grant Cameron show one time, and she come on and she was very real. And I ask anybody if they've ever seen a reptilian, and she comes on very calmly, and she says, yes, they do have stubbly black hair on their chin and on their on their jaws. And she says, I've seen several. She said, I don't want to see them no more. But she says, Mr. Emmons, I just wanted to tell you that, yes, you're right. They do have black stubbly hairs on their chin and on the side of the, the jaw. And in the camera, you can see it. You look close enough. Uh, I just haven't gotten a computer forensic video guy to clean this this thing up. But the other one, Cass, that you were talking about, the bright beings, the light beings. Yeah. I've got I got a video of one of those that came into my kitchen and its head reared reared back as it, it, it materialized. And it was just a bright, shining figure, about eight feet tall. Standing. I would definitely like to see this, sir. Yeah, it's it's now that's a clear one, but you got to look fast 
the, it's on the right side of the, of the frame and it comes in and you see the energy uh, streams, two of them coming in and then it comes all, all the way in and its head goes back and its head actually looks like it's wrapped, you know, like that, that one, the uh, Tuscaloosa thing or whatever it is that the aliens they had that looked like wrapped mummies. Well, this head, that, you mean Pasca- Pascagoula? Calvin Pascagoula, Parker, yeah. Pascagoula, yeah. Okay, I, you know, okay, I'm getting that old. Yeah, I know. That's, no, I just <laughs> want to make sure to talk about the same but, thing. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I need correction on those, some of those things. No, sometimes. no, no. You're doing great. I, but uh, no, it's uh, it looked like the, its head was wrapped because I got a picture, and I try to still frame these things, and I I get a, I got a picture of it going its head going back, and it looked like it was wrapped, and it had eye openings, it had a nose opening and a mouth opening, and this this wrap was around its head. And it just bounced backwards. And then all of a sudden, these orbs just floated all in my kitchen. It was just orbs, orbs, I was about to ask. Yes, orbs. Yeah, w- was with this thing when it come in. Yeah. So, Dave, if, if, we, uh, if we went in that same direction of the Pascagoula incident, which um, Calvin Parker kind of described what he saw as um, when what you saw, as a um, some sort of robotic creature, not necessarily um, not necessarily living, could be living, could be, but he felt it was robotic in nature and um, was sort of a, a minion of of some sort of higher being. What was your thought? Did did you think this was was an actual being, or could it have been some sort of robotic yes. device used by a alien creature? It was a light being, and I think Cass might know a little bit about those also that. They're light beings. They come through, and they're around us, but you can't really see them. But infrared can pick them up. That's why my camera yep. picked up this this light being in my kitchen, and that's why it picked up all this these energy streams and orbs. Uh, you can't pick them up with the naked eye. They were walking right around me. I that's- had a reptilian looking over my shoulder when I was on my computer, loading his film. And there's a chatter because I, I filmed, actually, I couldn't download, something was wrong with my computer. I couldn't, I couldn't download the, the, the video and send it to a friend of mine. So I took my camera and I, I took a film of it, a short video of it. And when, while I was doing it, there was a chattering noise in behind me. I couldn't hear it with my ears, but the phone picked it up. It was a, like electronic uh, ah. metal, metal chattering. And, and I thought this was a reptilian being that was looking over my shoulder and chattering and I couldn't hear it, but he knew it was going into the phone because of the magnetics. So yeah, he was looking right over my shoulder and that kind of scared me to think these things are that close. They're invisible. Uh, even reptilians go invisible. Little grays can be invisible. So they're, they're in your house. They're around you. I even, I've even talked to explorers who, and investigators who've had Bigfoot and they said that they, they can be invisible too. I've had two uh, explorers who I, I really have, you know, a lot of credence in, 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 the, in the stories, and they say that they can be invisible also. Yeah, that's uh, true according to Native Americans as well. Mm-hmm. Uncle can come in and out of reality at will. Right. But uh, in my book, there's – when I wrote the book, I had a lot of scientific notes, ledger notes that I've been holding on for some years. I've been writing them since uh, 09, uh, you know, 2009. And my, most all of my action was from 09 to 2012. I had so much, I, I guess, ET action. I even spent a day with, a, with an alien in Sedona. And it was a, a Japanese Asian gal. She was strange. I went and took notes when I got home and I talked to her in my car. It was cool and rainy, so there wasn't anything else to do. So she talked to me, but she tried to elicit or extract emotional feelings from me because they don't know emotions. They're trying to learn our emotions. Truth. And they're practicing. Truth. And she was practicing. She was weird. She said that, that we were supposed to meet, told me that several times, said she was want, wanting to have a baby. Well, that night I found out through regression, uh, she got that baby apparently from me because from what I understand, she was my daughter. Yeah, okay. I was hoping you'd go into that story. That's one of the things I read about you today, actually. So thank you for clarifying that. So let me just, I just want to open up a little bit about emotions here because, you know, so many times that, um, you know, that's one of the things that I wouldn't say I preach upon, but, you know, relating to my own experiences, I talk about, 
these emotionless beings and, um, and me being in their presence and they're almost stunned because, um, you know, I'm, I'm full of emotion. I'm like a coiled up spring that's ready to just burst. And, you know, a lot of that's fear. Then, then the fear becomes anger. And then, you know, I was, I was in these positions where I'm trapped and I'm, you know, face to face, you know, and I called it a Mexican stare down because neither one of us could move. And, um, my thought was always the fact that, or I shouldn't say the fact, but my thought was always the theory that these emotionless beings were so overcome physically in a way by my energy of, of my emotion that, that they were unable to even function in my presence. Whereas you have people who basically sort of give in to the whole process and um, they're able to be manipulated where I wasn't able to play well with others and that we just kind of, you know, locked heads and we're, we're frozen and, and staring at each other. So, Dave, you said you felt that this person was emotionless and I want Cass to hear this too because, you know, I hear so many people talk about, oh, there, you know, there's so much love and there's so much this and there's so much that. You know, I didn't see that or ever feel that. So somebody clarify that for me. Well, she she put on a fake cry, and I felt her hand. Her body was burning hot. She just had on a real light sweater and a tank top, a little, uh, I guess you call them wife beater tank tops, whatever. But And then she had on Levi's, in which were dirty. She wore no jewelry, no makeup, no watch, no cell phone, didn't have anything on her. And I thought, this is not typical of a woman in her early 30s. I, that's where I thought she would be in the early 30s. And there was a guy next Did she to have me. a funny smell? No, no, didn't smell anything. Uh, next, next to me, there was a car that pulled up. A young guy, about 25, 26. He had short cropped hair and he had a headset on. Uh, kind of looked like what you have on, Cass. He had, he had, but his was a white headset. And he pulled in and out several times within an hour and a half. And I was worried about that. I looked at her and I said, do you know him? She shook her head and she looked at me with dark, piercing eyes. Her eyes were so dark and piercing that I could feel the back of my head burning. I had to turn my head from her several times because she was, I said, you got piercing eyes. I said, what's going on with you? And I said, how old are you? She kind of showed me her, her anger. She was practicing anger. She goes, why does everybody worry about age and time? She said, there is no age. There is no time. Yeah, red flags, they were popping up. I, I went back to my room and made a lot of notes, yes. Uh, so she was, uh, she was different, but in journalism, and I went to journalistic school, and I make notes and scientific notes, but you can't convert scientific notes into a book because the publisher don't like it. You got to write it in book fashion. <laughs> you got to write orderly book fashion. So you put vampires in it. Yeah. That's, that's, so that's what I did. I, 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 you know, I, I took my time uh, and, and I wrote it uh, and all by myself, a little help from Grammarly sometimes, uh, especially looking for different words. Uh, you know, I want to use colorful words. I want to use not the same words all the time. And some of us writers will get in that more than just two syllables. Yeah, and some of us writers, uh, or beginning writers, will kind of use your own terminology over and over, in which gets boring. So that's why I, I chose uh, Grammarly. It can give me different adjectives, uh, uh, you know, pronouns, uh, verbs. But the other shoe did not hit the floor as far as journalism is concerned. I spent the next day with her, too, uh, until about 3 o'clock. And she was weird then, too, but uh, it was... She didn't really eat much. We, I took her to breakfast. She didn't eat much. And then she went to the bathroom each time she ate. Maybe she threw it up. I don't know. Maybe she didn't eat our food, but she was pretending. Uh, but then what really happened six months later, this is what locked her into the ET status. March 17th, 2011. It was, 20, it was October 4th, 2010, when I ran into her in, in Sedona. March 17th, 2011, about six months later, her and two young guys were down the street from me and they was walking towards us. My cousin and I was sitting on the front porch and it was warm for an Illinois uh, afternoon. It was about 74 degrees, really nice. And we sat there, smoked a cigar, and these 
and these uh, Asians were walking towards us. And then the gal turned around, same clothes, white sweater, denims, and the two young guys approached us. They come up to us about 10 feet from us. One was a, looked like he was about 15. The other one looked like he was 16 or so. He was kind of the leader. He's a little bit taller. And what, what they did to us then, they asked me a question. Where's the new Walmart at? I said, well, it's over this overpass, and you go that way. That was all I could say. I was done. They, they dumbed us down. We couldn't talk, my cousin nor I. We could not say a word. I just sat there and looked at him. My cousin wasn't even looking at him. He was so dumbed down that he was staring down at the floor of the, of the porch. And I thought, what's going on here? And uh, they had the dark, beady eyes, too, these two. And actually, he went past me two times to go into my door, and he brought out an attache case. I call it a pleather case because it's cheap pleather. I use it to put my notes in to keep the water off of it. And he was looking in those notes, and he looked up at me, and I thought, wait a minute, I couldn't figure it out. Was that my attache case? Because he didn't have nothing in his hand when he walked up to us. And he was he actually went in and got the attache case. He knew where the notes on his mom, let's say his mother, she was just 100 feet down the road, and she had her back turned to me because she didn't want me to see her. Well, the feeling of being dumbed down, when that happens to you, you never forget it. You don't, it's like there's nothing, all you got to do is observe. That's what they want you to do. They don't want you to talk. They don't want any physical interaction, no cameras, no ball bats, no weapons. Just sit there and observe, and we're going to do the rest because we have the power on you. So we were dumbed down for a while. Then they started walking away, and I saw them as they walked across my road in front of my house. And then my cousin finally woke up, and he looked around. He said, where are they at? And I said, right there. He said, when did you start seeing them? I said, right at the road. I said, you were out, buddy, really. He goes, Dave, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, this is the scariest thing I think I've ever been through. I've never been through anything like this. And he said, those damn ETs are going to kill you one of these days. I said, all right, let's watch where, where they go. Because I, we can see up and down the two-lane highway. We could see where they would go if they turn left or if they turn right. What happened after that, they walked up to the stop sign. We were sitting there looking at them. And at the, at the, all the while we were looking at them, they just disappeared, gone. They did not go down the road or up the road. And then that's when my cousin really went wacko. He started cussing, and he says, I'm getting the hell out of here. He said, this is crazy. He said, who were they? He said, he's, he said the Chinese. I said, no, they're Japanese. I said, but they're ETs. He said, oh, my God. I said, yeah, you just witnessed an ET event dumbing down and then kind of reading our minds. And the funny thing about it, you ever heard of the towels hum? Either one of you has ever yeah, heard of that? Yeah, sure. Okay, I have that. Uh, matter of fact, I know a guy in New Mexico who's a scientist. Him and I are pretty good friends, and we communicate. And he, he taught me a lot about the Taos home, and I got it. And the next day, pretty weird, I, I actually put together an ET encounter and the Taos home together in one visit. My cousin, the next day, called me. He said, the damnedest thing was going on. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning walking around the neighborhood trying to find a diesel motor running. He said there was a diesel motor running all night long in, you know, where I live. And I said, you never found it? He said, no. I said, you had the towels hum. He said, what the hell is that? He's not, a, he's about as shallow as a dry creek bed. Okay. When it comes to, you know, open-minded thought, uh, thoughts and everything. So I have to kind of talk him into things. And I told him, I said, that's the towels hum. I said, you're, you might've gotten it from these ETs, they might have put an implant in each one of us. I got several implants. I dug out two of them in my time. And I said, you might have gotten an implant. He said, where in the hell would it be? I said, I don't know. I wouldn't know. And, you know, we'd have to put an instrument on you and find out. And I said, if you got the towels hum, that's the first time I equated the towels hum with an ET visit. So what does that mean? I put that in my book. I, I summed it up by saying, it's strange. My cousin had this ET encounter with me. The next day, he had the towels hum, and he never did before that. So, what is a towels hum? It's like a it's like a an idling diesel engine at a distance, 
it's kind of a rumbling. It's a 20 hertz under. You, we we're not supposed to really hear it. Uh, that we're not supposed to hear anything 20 hertz and under, you know, low, uh, low, low sound. Gotcha. And, so you're saying he's emitting a subsonic frequency after that right, encounter. Right. Yeah. Implant. Yeah. So, yeah. And, there, think, and there's also um, in, in New Zealand, there's the Auckland and there's the Windsor, Ontario. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, some people, you know, can hear that and some people can. They could be in the same the same place at the same time and, and one person out of a group or maybe, you know, half the group can hear it. And then with some people, it's, it stays with them, you know, and, and doesn't go away. They hear it almost right. indefinitely. So, um, yeah, I hear it all the time. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it seems low and I don't hear it too much. I have to have, I have to have some kind of a white noise around me quite a bit to get away from it, but I've learned to live with it. And a lot of people, it, it drives them crazy, but it doesn't bother me. I believe it could have been from my ET uh, contacts, just like my cousin. It's funny that that that's that happened that way in that in that timely order. Uh, so it tells me that uh, I might be onto something if if the if the hum can be created by the ETs. Yeah, I that that's an interesting thing, just the hum itself. But then when you put that experience together, um, I'd like to get Cass's interpretation maybe of that and this Asian lady that just kind of showed up in the middle of nowhere or unannounced. Right. Cass, what do you think? Well, for starters, I would like to say, uh, so you've already had experiences with visitors. I don't need to be nervous. Yay. <laughs> so that's handy. Good. Good. Now, as far as, uh, as far as this, this, uh, this lady goes, yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty nasty situation. Um, you guys were lucky to get out of that the way you did. Okay. Yeah. Well, she she liked me for some reason, and uh, I had a regressed dream, Cass. After that, uh, mm -hmm. a very lucid regressed dream, and it was it, it. I was in the lodge room, the room that I stayed in, room number fourteen, and I was on the right side, no, the left side of the bed as you're facing it. And that's closer to the restroom. So I, I laid there and I was I, I woke up about the middle of the night and I saw somebody, they had my right knee in the air and then they had a small tube running to my groin area. It was a brownish tube, a brownish a tan tube. I could make out the color. It went to my, my groin area. I kicked it away with my knee. And then after that, I don't remember nothing. They must have really knocked me out then. Then, yeah. I remember, then I remember getting up. They got me up. One of them grabbed me by the arm, my elbow, and the other one was walking beside me on my other side, walking me back and forth in this room, and they had a bright light. It looked like about a six- to seven-inch fluorescent light, really bright light. And as I was walking, this one would just keep flashing this light in my eyes. I remember it hurting my eyes. And I, I, I ducked down and then they hit me again when I, when I opened my eyes again, cause I was watching the door and I went up to the, the patio doors and then they turned me around and walked me back again. I saw two silhouettes, humanoid silhouettes sitting at that little table in the room. And they, they did this several times and I saw the light, it hurt my eyes. And what they do is erase your memory with bright light. But guess what? They didn't do a very good job. I, I sometimes I, I can regress those subconscious thoughts and memories. So I did. And that's, that's how I found out they use light to erase your mind. And the reason why I was wondering, why did they get me up and walk me back and forth? Could you think of a reason, Cass? I, I can't hear you. Uh, Sorry. Probably to flush the toxins. Uh, well, actually it, it, I thought of it for a while. It took me a while to think of this and, and simple as it sounds is, if you're laying down, you're going to close your eyes, right? So they won't be able to flash your eyes very good. If you're walking, you ha you'll open your eyes automatically to see where you're walking. So that's when they hit you with the light. Your eyes will be open, and they can they can manipulate your your memory better with your eyes open than they can with them closed. So Makes that's sense. why they walk me. That does make sense. Yeah. So, but these guys are my these guys are my enemy. Keep that in mind. So so, you know. so okay okay okay. Who are these guys? 
Well, if my hypothesis is correct, based on his uh, description, he was dealing with the tribe of uh, reptilians that the UFO crowd knows Dracos, which would explain the serpent folks' interest in him. See, the thing is, the serpent people, they're not from anywhere. They're from here. You know, they're from Earth. Right, yeah. So I think the, the reptilian poking his nose through your window was one of them, you know, judging by the description. Well, no, he was in my bedroom. He was standing near my closet, yeah. Yeah, well, you, yeah. we were talking about the same guy, though. Okay, okay. So, so why I have so, trouble with English. Why, <laughs> why so many Dracos? I mean, it seems because they're from here and they're, they're just here. No, like, the Dracos aren't from here. Okay. The serpent folk are from here. Okay, but why, why so many? Why, why do we have so many occurrences of Dracos? Because they seem to be prevalent. Uh, because yeah. they're trying. What about the Asian? Is there an Asian connection you know about that uh, are connected? Because I've heard of other people seeing Asians get off a, a flying saucer or a UFO, and then they saw them get back on, and they said they looked Asian. Is there yeah. an Asian uh, t- tribe? I wouldn't say there's an Asian tribe, but there there are tribes who blend in with with traits that humans would consider Asian, like, for example, the uh, the narrow eyes and things like that. There is an Asian connection to the uh, to, to the Dracos in it's sort of inborn, you know, kind of like how the Pleiadians have a connection to the Native Americans sort of bred in, you know, same thing with the uh, with the uh, Chinese with the, you know, the Chinese region, not saying that if, you know, the Chinese are not human. Okay, but even in their own legends, their first emperor was mingled with the blood of a god, specifically a yellow, a golden dragon. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And of yeah, course, you've you got the Nordics, uh, the Swedes, Scandinavia, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, they, that, that's an offspring, you think? I'm not really sure. There's a lot of connection people suspect between them and uh, the ETs that they call Nordics, but I don't think that's the case. I think that that right. the that the Nordics. It's uh, more or less coincidence. I mean, they're both primate. Fe- you guys and them are both primate phenotypes. So the idea that that they would sort of grow along a similar, you know, coloration, it's not unreasonable. You know what I mean? Right. But I don't think they're they're blood connected to like the Aryans or anything like the uh, the Thule were trying to con- the Thule occult society was trying to claim. Right. I have seen people. Like there was a book, and I love David Jacobs, Doctor Jacobs, because he's written some books that that hit me smack between the eyes. They walk amongst us. You've heard of that book? Well, I actually, no. You haven't? Yeah, uh, they walk amongst us, and uh, they're talking about ETs that walk amongst us. I've seen them, and my brother actually saw one with me at a museum, and yeah. uh, I saw one at the as a, at a Cabela's one time. And uh, I was standing, I'll tell you what they, what, how they operate. I was standing there looking at the shorts rack. And here walks in this guy, about six foot two, kind of a big guy. He wore a, an expensive suit. He had close cropped hair, early 40s. It looked like kind of like one of the alphabet guys. He comes over to the rack on the other side and he stares at me. I'm standing there looking up at him. I'm looking at my shorts and I throw it in my cart and I looked up at him. And I wanted to say something, but I couldn't because he had energy that was suppressing my my words and my thoughts. So I looked at him some more and I was gonna ask him, What who are you? You know, I I'd wanted to ask him that, but I couldn't. And if you know me personally, I'm a very outspoken person. I've actually done comedy on stage. I'm a musician and I've done I've done that type of thing. I'm an outgoing person, but when I'm dumbed down, I don't say nothing. And then this guy, after about two minutes of standing there. I just kind of sat it out a little bit and I kept looking at him. He walks around the other aisle. As soon as he does, I run over to look to see where he's going. And he was gone. He disappeared, just gone in a flash. Same thing that happened to a guy at the museum. He's at the St. Louis Museum. My brother and I looking at the Egyptian, uh, I guess, display they had there. There was a guy in behind us, had his hands in behind us. He looked like a human. He, he, he was, uh, he had a white shirt on. He had no museum ID on him, no placard, no lanyard or anything on. So he didn't work for the museum and he was watching us. And every time I turned around, he was watching us three times. I told my brother, said, turn around slowly and look at this guy. He turns around and he said, yeah, he's watching us. I said, yeah, he doesn't work for the museum. I wonder who he is. And then he walks away. And I told him, my brother, let's check him out. So we ran around the corner again, around another exhibit. He was gone. He was just, just boom, gone. 
So yes, they come and go when they please. Uh, are they dimensional? Uh, they walk amongst us. I don't know. The, uh, you know, do all aliens have that, that, that ability? It's a consciousness protrusion into uh, ready enabled DNA sequences. So, but yeah, the, the, the whole walking, you walking while you're disappearing thing. It's kind of like the it's same, same technique really as the Aborigines use where, you know, like you look away and then you look back and the dude's like 40 meters away. Same kind of thing, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's closer to a mind whammy on everyone around them than it is like an actual portation effect. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Well, you're pretty sharp on, on some of the details that I don't, I don't normally study or get into. Now my next book, I am going to do some research and study and, and compare what I know with, with the ancients and, and with the, uh, the God of gods, you know, smart. Yeah, I want to do that. I want to get into uh, uh, studying this stuff so I can compare through time how that affects my experiences and who these people could really be. We Wise. Wanna, yeah, we want to know that. And uh, I, I want to read, uh, you know, the, the beginning of the, the biblical history. Uh, you know, we're talking about Noah and, and uh, Abraham and all that. And because I believe... They were ETs. They were gods. They were gods with a little G. Uh, but God with a big G, he controls the whole universes, not just one, but many universes. Yes. Uh, so that's what I want to do and, and you know, put that research together with, with what, what I already know from my own experience. And that should, that should tie things up a little bit. I, I had a phenomenon, Cass, I want to talk to you about. I didn't know this until I wrote my, my first manuscript. And I, I went through the manuscript and I, I, I did a rewrite to make it sound better and to really take a look at it closer. So when I did that, I was paying attention to the dates. I didn't want to do a chronological order book because the publisher didn't want that. But I put the dates in there to let me know when these things happen. There's a phenomenon that's going on there's three types of, of abductions. Let me see if you agree with this. Number one is bedside abduction. They can do DNA, blood tests, scan your memory in your bed without moving you, just knocking you out. And they can take semen samples like they did me in bedside. So I, I know three, four times that happened to me. And that's number one way of, of abducting. Number two is they take your body your whole body, you go on a ship, they, they just, you know, zoom you up, Scotty, you know, up there, and you go on a ship. I've been on ships in regressed dreams, and I've seen things. And then the third way, this is what happened to me, I'd say, from 2016 until last year, 2021, six times this has happened to me. And I'll, I'll, this is the third form of abduction that I've seen, and I've been studying that's happened to me. What they do is they take your energy, they take your soul, your consciousness, your mind, and they holographically take you to another dimension with them. And they, they do something with you or they're teaching you something. There's something meant for you to do. So when I had these experiences, let me tell you how I felt. This is new stuff, Cam, that I, that I, haven't, I didn't talk sure. about on your show a couple of years ago. Uh, this is all brand new the last couple of years. So I at 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up. I was shaking. And I'm a big guy, so the whole bed was shaking. My wife did not wake up. If I drop my cell phone on the carpet, she wakes up. She says, what's wrong? I said, oh, I just knocked the cell phone off of the nightstand. And she goes, oh, okay. But she did not wake up. I was shaking the bed violently when I woke up. I felt my arms. I was ice cold. I'm not talking about cold. I'm talking about freezing cold. Like you spend like an hour in, in a, inside of a, a freezer. Naked. Yeah. And when I, I, ha, I woke up and I had the blankets on me. I had a blanket and a sheet. And I, I looked at the, at the temperature gauge later. The room was 70 degrees all night long. So it wasn't cold in the room, but I was freezing cold. 
I had to get up and go to the bathroom. Each time this happens, I have to go take a leak because something with the freezing temperatures causes you to take a leak. So I go take a leak while I was on the toilet. I couldn't stand up, so I had to set. I was shaking violently, and I thought, okay, am I dead? My body is cold. Am I just walking around the house? Did I die in bed? That's my. That was one of my thoughts. And my arms and my legs and my head was ice, ice cold. I should have been dead at that temperature. Yeah. It sounds to me like you learned something in hyperspace that shook you to your core. That sounds like you were soul frozen. Okay, this happened six years in a row. And it happened, three of them happened on August, between August 12th and August 14th, each year, three of them. One happened in September 2nd. So it was about a month late. And one they made up for happened in January. They, they did it. It's 2019. They made up for 2018. And then 2020, it happened the first week of September also. And then 21, last year, it happened right, I think, right at September 1st or 2nd again. It was between middle of August and September 2nd. It happens every year. And I, I have it in my notes. And I, I, when I found that out, I thought, this is weird. And I asked three doctors, what's wrong with me? And they, they looked at my blood. They said, you're not diabetic. Nope. I, they said, your heart been checked out okay. You don't have any blood disorders. All three of them said, we don't know. We don't, we really don't know. No, what you, want, what you need to do is uh, look into weather patterns and especially electromagnetic frequency patterns. What you're going to see is around that year, there's a seasonal gate that opens up. It's a lot easier to use natural gates than it is to, you know, try to force matter between spaces. Are those, those times that I, like in the middle of August, do you know? Yeah, late August, early September. I know because that's my birthday. Really? That's, yep. you're, you're that's, right what, that's what Cass does for his birthday. Every year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I messed extra, with humans. Extraterrestrial <laughs> treat. <laughs> but uh, no, that's that's uh, something to to really know. I mean, that's that's uh, scientific data that I need to go back and, and look at and put, like I said, put science and history to what's going on with me. My first book is straight up about my experiences. My second book is going to be a little bit of research here and there and trying to come to a reasoning of what what happened in the first book. So I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the title and get it ready to go. And, uh, but when my first book comes out in two or three weeks, then I'll, I'll start probably working on the next one real, really quick. But so, yeah, I, I turn into a writer and I, I don't, I've never, never did do any writing before, but <laughs> I did this book all by myself too. I well, just, once, you, once you start, you can't stop it. Yeah, it's true. Have, has any, any of you two written a book or anything or. Yes, actually. Um, um Cass has a book. I'm, I'm in the middle of one. And, and I was going to ask you a question about writing the book, Dave, and, and nothing specific about the book. But, you know, one of the things that, that I get criticized, I, I wouldn't say criticized, but people kind of chew on me a little bit about, they, they think that I'm too skeptical for this, for this crowd. And it's, and it's not, that's not really what's happening. It's the fact that I kind of hold back because, um, you know, have all these stories. And once I throw these stories out, I think I'm done. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, throw it all out there and then, you know, have nothing left to go back to. So, you know, it's, it's, so I kind of make it about you guys and it's not about me, of course, and it should be that way, but, um, you know, there's, there's some background. And so what do you, how do you feel about that? I guess is what I'm asking because, you know, um, obviously it's fun to, to, get with people and, and talk about these stories. But then again, you know, once it's out, it's out, you know, and even a guy like Whitley Strieber has all these fantastic um, stories and, and there's, there's other people out there the same way, you know, like Calvin Parker, you know, once his story gets out, you know, what's, what's left for you? Is it, is it uh, new books, new angles? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I was just talking about is making a, a more of a research, historical research sure. to, to authenticate my experiences. But I got a question for, for some people. They've had one incident, one event, in which I believe them. You know, they've had the, the one abduction, the one incident. And I know of several people who have that. But they've written a thick book. I guess I need to read their books thoroughly to find out how can you write so much on one experience. 
I've had many experiences. And so my book will probably be about 240 pages, but it's, but I had many experiences to get that, that many number of pages. I'm, I'm wondering how people can have one event and, and write a 300 page book. I, I'm well, curious, you know? Yeah. But I mean, you just, <laughs> it's easy. You look, you look at these books. I mean, I have a small library and, um, you know, they're, they're talking about, um, the same people over and over and over again, you know, I mean, you're going to, you're going to hear the same names pop up, you know, a lot of name dropping. They think that that's important, kind of gives them credibility, um, which that's not necessarily so, but, um, you know, yeah, they had an experience and it's interesting to hear about it, but of course, you know, it's not, it's not one of those things that, um, is going to carry them very far. So yeah, they're talking about other people talking about Stephen Greer. They're talking about whoever, um, you know, they're relating stories and how, how their experience relates to this, you know, A, B, C, and D, and these experiences that these other authors have had. So you're going to, you're going to pick up some books and you're going to read about those things over and over again. That's, you know, once Amazon came along and, and you could take a look at the first 30 pages of a book, you know, it was nice to weed through that, you know, where you couldn't do that in the past. And, you know, 25 years ago, there wasn't a lot of books. I mean, there was a lot of books, but um, we were just starting to get access to, to those, to that library online, or if there was an, an online library, um, there was like half.com when, when that came out, you know, that, that was a huge, huge gift for, for everybody who liked to collect books like that, because, you know, you could get those type of books that, um, that you're talking about, Dave, um, for pennies on the dollar. And, and I got them, you know, and I got a lot of them and went through a lot of them. And, um, you know, I've, the newer books, you know, I'll read and, and give away to people. But, um, you know, those older ones, even even if they're really, really bad, I hang on to them because, I don't know, no, I, like, I like paper. I like smelly old yeah. paper. But but I, I'm i not saying that I disagree with these people who have the one event and can write 300 pages. I'm actually jealous. I mean, I wrote maybe a little over 200 pages. But you have to read my book from start to finish, and you'll see different events different things yeah, but it's all about you you're not they're not rehashing you know and and you yeah. probably didn't print your um book in, in 16 point you know yeah yeah times I, roman or something like that <laughs> you're not it, you're it, not it, you're not filling pages with nothing you know yeah it's 12 in the art biz we call it padding yeah there's yeah. some substance there man yeah and, and fluff you know i yeah. guess that comes from yeah. another field yeah. so we don't want to talk about that but uh i, I had 12 font and that's what i used and I think that's going to be, and I got 19 pictures in the book. Right. And, right. and actually, these are customized pictures. So they're not, so, the, not the pictures you took, the, the trail cam? I'd like to see those. Uh, no. Me those, too. Those were, uh, I showed the publisher those, the, the video of the reptilian. I, I'm, I, I got mad, not mad, but I got upset the other night with this guy who's, who's in charge of putting this uh, reptilian statue in the New York museum. And there, and Kathy Martin picked certain people. She picked me and asked me if I won't want to do it. And she said, Dave, that might give you publicity on your book because there might be a plaque, you know, uh, you know, given you as a, a contributor to this, the statue. But then I found out talking to these guys, it's just not me and a couple other people. There's a couple of dozen people they're interviewing. And I thought, I told these guys, I said, now, wait a minute. I was looking for some publicity for my book. You know, it, it was like, I, you know, because I was told that, yeah, if you're involved in this statue thing, you know, you're, you, can, you can put your publishing company in your name. No, it's not my publishing company. It's a, it's a Doug Hydecheck. And, uh, but get a little marketing off of that because be a bunch of people come to the museum. But from what I saw, they're not doing that. And I was just going to mention to you about the talking heads. A lot of the talking heads have never had experiences. What they do is they go by other yeah, figures. Experiences. Yeah. They <laughs> go by other people's experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they utilize your stories and their books and they make money and do the talking circuit about your experiences. Or they have and, a, they have a particularly good skill that they're able to adapt into the, uh, into ufology or, or the alien aspect and, and they're able to carry it that way. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to criticize anybody, even though I do sometimes, 
But um, I think that, um, you know, there's, there, there's people, uh, I mean, I, I like uh, Travis Walton. I like uh, Calvin Parker because they're just super real. And, um, you know, even though that uh, Travis Walton been wearing the same three suits for, for 45 years and 40 years and, and um, telling the yeah, same he, stories, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, and um, I like to hear, you know, one of the things I like to hear is, is the different perspectives that other people, you know, will, will, will spin that story yeah. with and kind of like what we have Cassidy Lightwing doing Yeah, I was at Travis Walton's house in Snowflake, Arizona. Oh, really? That's cool. Visited him. Yeah, I know him, but he's he's kind of quiet. Yeah, and if you can't you can't share your experiences with him because he doesn't want to hear your experiences. Right, right. that's kind of weird in a way, right. you know. But uh, he he's just I think he gets nervous when he's at conventions. Well, I know he he had he was nervous at one convention. I I was at an Alamo, Nevada, and uh, the guy that was in charge of the the convention. There's only about 35, 40 people there. He was at this podium. And he was shaking so much that the, the the cup of coffee was about ready to spill off into the floor. And the guy told me, he said, Dave, go up and grab that coffee before it, it, it dumps off into the floor. So he was nervous. I don't know if that's when he started. That was in 09. Uh, he he was hiding out for some time, and he, he didn't really want to talk about it too much, I think, at, at first. After the movie, I think he was really disgruntled about the movie and what direction it went. And after that, he kind of went quiet. And then he starts speaking again, but he's now he's got his, his, he's got his tempo. He's got his timing now, you know, when, and when he speaks, I, I've seen him speak uh, later on uh, in years and, and he's got his tempo and his timing now. He, now he's a pro, but he's talking from his experience in which I can appreciate. Yeah. Mr. Walton is in uh, several of the groups that uh, we post our show in. He actually watches uh, the Bradley power show sometimes and people keep asking me, well, why don't you bug him? Get him on the show. I'm like, man, that, that man has been through enough, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Just leave him be. Well, and it's, it's hard to talk about the same thing over and over, and especially like that to, to whoever, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm sure if there's some, some, some peers that he really respects, sure enough, he would, he would open the vault. But um, this is a dumb analogy, but my neighbor, um, who I bought a really tiny sailboat from, and we live on a lake, my neighbor – was on the front page of National Geographic because in 1960, whatever, he sailed around the world and he started when he was 15 years old. So, you know, when I'm telling him that I now I have his one of his little sailboats and I did this and that, he has he doesn't care. <laughs> I mean, he sailed around the world and, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, Cameron's in this little piece of shit boat. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. well, Grant Cameron come through for me. I was on his show three times uh, on it you know, a video show, Zoom show. And when I started at KCOR, that was, that's been over two years ago. And I asked him to be my first guest on that show. And he did, he come through. He's a pretty nice guy. You know, he's, he's pretty straight shooter and he does a lot of research on his own. He just doesn't take experiencers, you know, information. He does a lot of research about, you know, he goes out in the field and he checks things out. So he's, He's a he's one of the more knowledgeable guys as a talking head, uh, because he does a lot of research of his of his own. I, I I admire that in him, and he's always been nice to me. So, you know that's uh, that's one thing. But uh, he helped save my daughter. Really? Yeah. Uh, not sure. Oh yeah. Uh, well, Cam Cam and Cam and I have been friends for a while. So wait, we're talking about the same Cameron, right? No, he's talking about Grant Cameron. Grant Cameron. Uh, I say you mean Cameron Logan. <laughs> Grant Whoops. Cameron, the, the famous UFO investigator. But yeah. human names escape me sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh, they escape me all the time. I got a bad memory of, for names, especially, you know. But, no, I I meet a lot of, lot of uh, good, de- decent, honest people in radio. And I've had quite a few of them, like UFOs, archaeology, uh, giants, uh, the skeletons. Uh, a lot of UFO abductees, uh, people involved in MK Ultra uh, and CIA. I've had a lot of those, and then of course, uh, leading up to to uh, I, I'm try I want to I want to try to get uh, Yuri Geller to do a foreword in my in my book. Maybe <laughs> he has to he had to see the book first, I guess. So, uh, but him him and I are tuned in together. I like I like the guy. He's real nice. He's he's original. 
I, I think he's that. peeking on you. Point of fact. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Looking out for you. Yeah. I think ever since I've talked to him, things have been really moving fast for me. I can get his energy. Yeah. I, I got, he got my energy too. That's what he told me on, on the air. Uh, so that'll be in tomorrow night's show that he, he tells me that he felt my energy from the, from the email. So, and that's why he answered because he normally wouldn't do Vikings do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He showed that several times while we were talking to him, he showed that, that talent, but it was unique to have him. I, I've seen him when I was a kid. He's only two years older than me, really. And I saw him when I was younger in the seventies. Uh, so I've seen him bend spoons and do that. That was his, that was a gimmick. He said, he said his biggest thing was getting involved with people and, and knowing people and reading people. And that's what he did with the CIA. Yeah. My dad had me uh, studying Mr. Geller. So. Yeah. Uh, can I tell you guys a story about uh, Yuri? What he told Please. Me? Okay. This was in the early seventies, maybe right at 70, 71. Warner von Braun, the Nazi from Germany, the, the, the rocket scientist, he heard about a Geller, Yuri Geller, and he called him out to New Mexico. He wanted to meet him. So Yuri took his brother with him because he was kind of like a producer for him and would, you know, be his helping hand. So he went into Werner von Braun's office and they both stood there and he looked at him and he says, I'm Yuri Geller. You, you wanted to see me? He said, yes. And then Yuri Geller said, I got a question for you before you, you start saying anything. How could you kill so many people with your V2 bombs and rockets and and have and feel good about it or, or or not have a guilty conscience? He told Yuri, he said, Well, I think I relieved a lot of people of the pain here on earth and sent them to a better place. He said, That's how I, I look at it. And Yuri said, That's kind of a strange way of looking at it, Mr. Von Braun. He said, But that's still, you know, you're still killing people with your technology. Uh, but then they went on and he said, well, I've heard a lot about you, Yuri. That's what Von Braun said. He said, he took a coin off his desk. He gave it to Yuri and he said, if you can bend this coin, he said, I'll show you more. So he takes the coin, puts it in his hand, Yuri does, and he thinks on it for about 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And they said he gives it back to Von Braun and it was bent. The coin was actually bent and he did not move his hand or bend it. It just, he bent it with his psychic energy. He gives it to Von Braun and he says, you are real. And Yuri says, well, I hope so. He says, uh, you know, or you wouldn't have called me here if I wasn't. He said, well, I wanted to find out for sure. So he said, let me show you something. He goes back to a little safe. He says, if you can tell me what this is, I'll even show you something more. He pulls out this little sheet metal. He said it was only about maybe six, eight inches wide, a square. He gives it to him. He said, tell me what this is. Yuri feels around on it, looks at it. He said, it's not from here. He said, it's not from Earth. And he says, you're right. It's part of a UFO. It's metal from a UFO or a flying saucer, whatever they called it back then. And then so Yuri got that right. So he says, okay, let's go. Let me get my driver. We're going to go out to a bunker, and I'm going to show you something. So they went out to this bunker, and there was Marines guarding the bunker. Uh, he told his brother to stay outside while they went inside. So they went in, and they got these big Arctic jackets, these coats, real thick coats. And Yuri asked him, he says, why do we need these? And he goes, it's not cold in here. He says, where I'm going to take you, he said, you're going to need them. So he went to this room, and what he did was he opened up the door, and it was really cold. It was freezing. And Yuri said when he walked in, he said he was shocked from what he saw, but he could not tell us what he saw. He's under an NDA with the CIA. So those initials mean a lot, I guess. So he doesn't want to tell. Yes. He said, he said, read my mind. He said, he said, you'll know what I saw. I said, I know what you saw. I said, freezing only contains biological material. They wouldn't freeze a UFO or a flying saucer in there. They said, I said, that has to be biological. And he says, I'm not saying anything. I said, I know what they are, what you're saying. They're, 
their bodies. You know, so he saw <laughs> alien bodies. That's what he saw, but he he couldn't say it because he's under CIA restrictions, and he still actually does work for CIA. So that's, that's fascinating. An story. That's an interesting story, and I I made him uh, retell that story, but I didn't. Uh, I think the last the second R, the producer, his computer shot craps, and it, it kicked out the recording. And he said he didn't notice it. There's two, a back, even a backup recorder. He said they both went out. And he said he didn't notice it. He thought they were, we were recording. And so we missed, we missed the second R. But we got one R of Yuri. But, uh, you know, Yuri usually doesn't do, uh, he told me, he says, I don't usually do, like, small-time radio. I mean, we don't have big numbers. We don't have, we're not, you know, we get up to, 19,000, 18,000 sometimes, but uh, depends on the guest and I guess the time of, of the day when we, when we release it or whatever, but uh, we get fair numbers for, for a startup, but he said, I normally don't, I don't do, you know, shows with low numbers. And, and uh, he said, but your show I did because I felt your energy. So they're bingo, you know? So 10,000 new podcasts a day, Dave. What's that? Ten thousand new podcasts a day. Yeah. I know. So yeah, stick with it and and yeah. um, keep driving. Uh, keep the drive alive, man. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're doing that. Uh, I you know my my producer. I know he's you know he's got some issue health issues, but he fights it and he he tries to stay with it. And he's a good producer, an excellent producer. We got all kinds of little fancy bells and whistles going off, you know. So it's he does that. I can't do that. I'm not computer savvy. But uh, I just get the guests, and I bring them on. I'm gonna have Kathy Martin on the show. I think the middle of February. So yeah, she's she's, she's fun to talk to. Yeah. Did you um? So you said you saw your first UFO when in, it was in the '60s, right? So yeah. um, we've had people call that kind of a well, more along the lines of the mid '70s, but um, even so, a part of a maybe a silent invasion. What do you what do you think of that? What do you think was happening and and um, you know, a lot, of, again, like you said, people are seeing um, aliens in their bedroom and, and having other experiences. But, you know, mm-hmm. why do we see ve- vehicles? What's what's happening? Well, they're here to watch over us. They're here. Some of them have actually been involved in manipulating our DNA. Cass said the right thing a while ago. He said that the, the hybridization program is in high gear, and I, they're doing that. Have you seen these little five and six year old kids that can play Mozart and everything on the piano? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're getting into an age where kids are learning so fast and it has to do something with the DNA that's being sped up. It, there's, there's some manipulation going on to this day. Still, when I had a, an implant and I, I took it out, I put it under a microscope. It looked like brain neurons were coming off of it and they were kind of crawling. What what part of the body Ooh. were you implanted? Uh in the left calf area and also in my left testicle area. And when I was 14 from from that one sighting my friend and I had in 1963, 2 weeks later I I felt a little lump. I was only 14 at the time. Felt the lump in my testicle. And I thought, what was that? And then I looked closer. There was a red line about an inch long. It was just a thin red line. I thought, what is that? And, and of course, you don't want to call your mom and say, Mom, could you take a look at this? You know, this, you, know you don't do that when you're, when you're an adolescent. You don't, you just, you, that's for with your mind. You don't want to do that. But I, like I, to, I like to make my parents feel very uncomfortable. So I probably, <laughs> would, I probably would have had that conversation. But go ahead. Uh, but I, I pushed off. I pushed this, this thing that felt like a, m M&M, kind of in a way, or an Advil a tablet, and I pushed it out that same red line. It come out without, without any blood, without much pain, because I pushed it back out the same line that was pushed back, that was pushed in to something with a laser cut. Now I know that that, that was a laser cut, and it was a thin red line, and it still did not heal back together, and I was able to push that, that implant back out. So I pushed it back out, put it in my hand, and it was ash color, light color, about the size of an Advil tablet. And as I held it out, it was turning darker brown because the oxygen hit it. And of course, it would, they make these implants to, they make them to where they just fade away or they just, 
uh, dissolve and they're and they're gone. And I watched my second one do that, but this one I showed my mom, and she said that's nothing but an ingrown hair. I said, no, it's not, mom. She goes, what do you mean? I said there was a thin red line in my testicle. I think at the time I said something else like playing ball, you know. So, and she said she stopped, and she was kind of like she was in shock, like for a moment. And because she didn't want to admit that there was flying saucers because we had scares back there on the radio back in those days. They said, don't get near a flying saucer. When you see one, run from it. Yeah, they had those notices out on TV and radio back in the 50s and 60s. I remember. Wow. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I'm still saying yeah. that today. So they're... Yeah. So we, I, I ran. But... I say check the make and model first. <laughs> <laughs> the sport, yeah. If you see the sport model, get the hell out of there. Right. So she told me, she said, throw it away anyway. And she was a little confused. And I, when I told her that there was a cut in my testicle. And uh, so she saw them herself. So she knew when she was younger, she's had a lot of uh, UFO and ET encounters herself through her life. And she, she'll only talk to me. And my older brother asked me, why doesn't she talk to me about those things? I said, because you haven't had the experiences. She knows I've, I've had the experiences. She also told me, and this was weird, she's 94. And she's still, you talk to her on the phone, she sounds like she's about 50. She's very, she's got an acuity, this, this mental acuity that's great. And, you know, I'd compare her with Biden any day. But, but uh, uh, she, she just, she knows a lot about things and she's been through a lot of things. She told me, she said, make sure you put it in your book that you were born with pretty gray sideburns. She said they were so pretty. She said they were, they were sideburns. And they were kind of long. She said, make sure you put that in your book. I said, why is that, Mom? She goes, because I think that was your beginning of being special to these, these ETs and them following me throughout my life. Because she thought that way. Because she, she was a, she's had encounters in her house. She's had dark figures, the, uh, the tall, thin guy come in the house. And actually, uh, she said that she didn't want to go in deep into it, but she was actually kind of, molested by these these entities and she would see them in the hallway walking towards you know her room and and i said you didn't tell me a lot about that she said well now you know a lot of stuff and now i'm telling you you know and and she said the rest probably wouldn't understand and i said yes i understand you know i i, I know what, what i said what happened to you is happening to me because they're following the family dna frequency what about that? Yeah. What do you know about that? That tracks. Uh, um, so speaking shamanistically, the sideburns thing, yeah, that's a major sign of a special birth. Uh, as far as tracking things genetically, um, I'm with you on this one. It sounds like that your mother hadn't had, had, had gotten impregnated and not to be crude, you know? Uh, so, possibility. She I, Actually, also, the, there's been other theories about why they follow certain people. DNA frequencies, maybe there's been some uh, what they call reincarnation of the soul, and maybe other ETs are following that soul that's inside me. Or uh, the other thing would be that they said we have Native American Indian blood in us. We have Crow Indian in our family, and they say they follow Indian blood for some reason. Yeah, they do. Uh, they follow they follow various uh, bloodlines because it's easier to track certain genetic configurations. So, like for example, the same um, genetic uh, abnormalities that uh, uh, Akhenaten had, for example, would allow him to speak to spirits and whatnot easier. And they're finding the same thing in like Native American shamans that they have this they have a certain reconfiguration of the twenty fourth chromosome. Right. So, yeah. Oh, that's why I keep telling people a lot. This has a lot more to do with like old Indian stories than it does with lights in the sky. And people just think I'm crazy. <laughs> so, well, you know, every day scientists are coming up with something new. They said, well, the human race is only a one and a half million years old. And then the next day they say, oh, no, it's 60 million years old. No, we found a hammer that was 250 million years old. And they found, they found a, a, a nuclear reactor in Africa that is something like a half a billion years old. And I thought to myself, yeah. there, we don't know, you know, it, like the ACDC song, who made who, you know, that's, 
Uh, we don't know who made who. We we know. <laughs> trying to put this in music because I'm a musician too, and they're attracted to musicians also. And I play music all my yes, life. Yes, they and, are. Uh, and and yeah. I'm I'm starting a band now. Actually, uh, late in life, I'm I got a just. I just recruited the other two guys and we're going to be playing out before long. So I love playing music. I played for thousands of people throughout my time. And uh, I was a drummer and a guitar player, guitar player at first in the seventies. And I went back to my original instrument in the late seventies on the drums. So, and it was an all brother band, all six of us played. And maybe that was an attraction too, you know, that all of our DNA frequencies together and playing music. So, uh, like John Lennon, they they tracked John Lennon down a couple of times. The ETs did. Oh, I wanted to tell you, it's not only the reptilian race that's been messing with me. In 1995, this is in my book. I actually got a drawing of this critter. It was about oh 1:30 in the morning, and my adopted daughter she would come through our bedroom to go in the in the medicine cabinet in our our main bathroom. And she would get aspirin out because she had headaches or whatever. So I thought it was her. And I got I got up and I cupped my chin in my hand. And I called out her name several times. I saw a dark shadow going across the mirror. And I thought it was her. So then I cupped my, my chin in my left hand. And I was looking off to my left. And here walks around this dark shadow. Comes up to me right beside the bed. And this was a little gray. He was anywhere from three and a half to four feet tall. And he was very wrinkled, very ugly. He didn't have, yeah, he didn't have his, his black shades on. I can actually see the whites of his eyes and, and his irises. And they were, they were dark. They weren't blue or anything like that. They were dark in color. His eyes were, and he just stared at me. I remember having fear running up and down my body. And when I was looking at this thing, and it just stared at me. And then all of a sudden I went out. And then he did that bedside abduction thing. He took semen from me that night. And that's probably where these two young Japanese ETs, that's probably where they come from. Uh, I had a lady, it was at a convention, and I went downstairs. They have all these, when you're at a convention, you have these people that are hawking books and all kinds of ornaments and things like that. But she was a kind of a, a spiritual reader. I was walking past her and it's an interesting story because she's so right on. And she says, Hey, come here. I said, no, I don't want a reading. I said, I said, I do my own readings. I said, I really do. I do my own readings. She goes, no, come here. I need to tell you something. And she said, you had a UFO or an ET encounter just recently. I said, yes, I did. And I said, somebody tell you that she goes, no, she said, you ran into your daughter. I said, what? She says, the woman that you ran into, she said, was your daughter. And I said, I got a picture in my suitcase in the room of her because I wanted to show certain people. She said, I don't need to see the picture. I'll, I'll describe what she, what she looks like. She's Asian, Japanese, but she said she has cheekbones like I got and a chin like me. And she says, how do you explain that? Except that was your daughter. I said, I, I had to stand there and I was just in, I was kind of like, wow, how'd she get so many things so right and know things without me even telling her. And then she told me to go over to this tall black guy in which he was dressed in a suit and he was posing with another guy as some kind of uh, avionics company. And he was a psychologist, he told me. And he dressed real nice. He had real hazel eyes. She told me, go over to him. She said, you have energy, and he's going to pick up on your energy. And I and she said, and you tell me what, who you think he is. And I said, okay. So I walk over to him. And so the other guy walks away. So this tall black guy, was. he looked at me, and I, I said, what are you selling? He said, nothing really. We're just trying to educate people on some of our, uh, our you know, or avionics that we're working with. I said, really, you're a psychologist? He said, yeah, as a psychologist, I work with him. I said, are you, are you lying to me? He said, no. And I said, let me ask you this question. I said, are you a hybrid? And he looks at me and he says, I'm reading your energy. He said, you have a lot of energy, don't you? And I said, yeah. I said, I've been around ETs. And I said, I'm looking at you 
And I'm thinking, you're a hybrid. He said, well, nobody's ever told me that, but he said it's a possibility. So bingo, you know, they, they're not going to come out and tell you. Uh, so, but I, I said, I think you're hybrid. I, by looking at your eyes and I said, in reading you, I think you're, you're a hybrid. And I said, there was a lady that told me that she thought you was a hybrid. And I said, she is really good at reading minds. And I said, she's right over there. And he looks around, he looks over at her. And I said, she knows you're a hybrid too. So it's, it's so, it's kind of like you get caught up into these little energy things, these energy plays around people. You can actually, once you start knowing how to read energy from people, Cass might be able to attest to this. You can actually pick out different energies that just don't fit in, in people yeah. or, or, or humans uh, or ETs that are uh, pretending to be humans. You pick out these different energies. And a lot of them, the ones that I ran into, they didn't have any emotions. I was sitting 10 feet away from one at a convention center and, and he just sat there. He just had a, he was very placid. He didn't say much. But when I got up, there was a friend of mine, it was a lady, and I got up, went to the bathroom, and he asked her, he said, is, is that your husband? He was asking about me. And she goes, no, he's just a friend. So that's the only words he said. But uh, while he sat in that meeting for two hours, he finally got up and walked out, didn't talk to nobody except for just asking her that question. And I can, I can just see his face now. It's just so, he was emotionless, like a robot. And I saw that before at another convention. I saw it in, in Arkansas. Two people. Oh, what happened, Kaz? I heard a weird sound and I didn't know what it meant. Yeah, that's on my end. I apologize for that, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, I get that, too. Sometimes when you get a, a message or something that pops through. So, Dave, I, I don't mean to break in like this, but I, I was wondering Here. if you had to... Um, capsule capsulate your experiences into one brief statement what would be the root cause why why you and um why so many experiences i like to i like to talk about the root cause what's the root there dave uh we were just talking about it about dna frequencies uh i believe that i was chosen to to be followed they tagged me early on in life and like my mom said she thinks that i was tagged early on uh, at birth, like Cass was saying, and I have the DNA frequencies that they that they they can follow. I wrote a five page. My uh, publisher asked me to write a conclusion. Uh, Cam, it took me five pages to explain my conclusion, so it'd right. be it'd be fairly long to say at each. You know, I I concluded the idea about the about the abductions. I explained about the three types of abductions. And now I'm into an abduction that's that's really weird. And I'm afraid, I'm actually kind of afraid for August coming around again because it's going to happen again. It's happened six times in a row. It'll happen again. I'm going to be frozen in bed. My wife's not going to wake up. My wife ask, actually asked me, she said, I didn't wake up, did I? I said, no, you didn't. You were out. And she usually wakes up if I just, like I said, you drop something on the carpet, she can hear it and she wakes up but she did not wake up all six times because I would have asked her. I, I was, right. honey, feel my arms. I said, I'm freezing. I don't know what's going on. And she probably would have called an ambulance and I, I wouldn't have known any better. But what, what happened is I went back to bed and I, I laid down, covered up and I was shaking and I went out. I was just out like a light because I was exhausted. Whatever, whatever hit me took all my energy, all my energy. And I was left just enough to cling on to life, I guess. Cause I felt like I was dead, but they're abducting. Do you want them to leave you alone? Uh, I'm curious. I don't want them to, I'm afraid of these freezing attacks. Uh, Cass, this is the first time I've been kind of afraid because what if they go too far and freeze me and I die? You know, this is, that's what I'm worried about the next time around. Or is that the way I'm going to go? I don't know. You know, I, it's six times, six years. It's, something it's, it's pretty taxing on the body. I have to say. Yeah. Uh, but to conclusion, I think there's, there's four ET races that are here on earth working with us. The rest of them that visit us, I think the uh, defense secretary of Canada uh, mentioned it uh, himself that there's something like 50 something races, ET races that, that visit this planet. Some of them just come here to visit. 
they take a look at our biology, take a look at our DNA. Uh, they're kind of uh, messing with us, you know, they're manipulating us. But I think the four main ETs on Earth, those are the ones that have been manipulating our DNA for, for a long time. I was on the ship in a regressed, very lucid dream. It was probably one of the most spectacular lucid dreams I've ever had. I showed up on this ship. I was on a hallway, and it was all metal, all metallic. I'm, I'm getting to a conclusion. What I'm I, This is one of the conclusions I come up with. I, I started walking down this hallway. The, the hallway floor was a little rough. It kind of looked like some kind of a fiber, but the walls were all stainless steel looking. It all, the whole ship was just pristine, shiny, clean. I walked down this hall, and I looked in these rooms, and I saw humanoid figures. I couldn't see their faces, but I looked in, and I thought these, these rooms where these ETs were at were doing something. And I walked into a big hallway. It opened up to a big room. There was three podiums. There was three really tall humanoid-looking beings. I couldn't make out their faces. For some reason, they blotted that out from, from my memory. And they each had an animal or some kind of a, one looked like a half uh, chimpanzee and a half kangaroo from a distance. And there was three different animals. There was three different podiums and there's a bunch of humanoid ETs standing there. They were giving some kind of lecture about different life forms, I guess. I turned around, I started walking back and there was a black box on my right, following my right foot. The box must have been about 12 inch square and it was black and it was following my right foot. I looked down at it a couple of times. I wondered, what is that box doing? And I have a thought about that after I get down to the story here. I kept walking. I ran into these look like women in these white smocks. They looked like pure white, uh, like, like these suits that the uh, nuns wear, except they were pure white. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And there were about three of them. There's some standing. parallels there, Dave. You're talking, you're talking yeah. my, my uh, experience. Go ahead. Yeah. And then I, I looked in between what these women were doing. There was a six month old, looked about six months old, humanoid baby with three eyes. It wasn't a cyclops eyes. It, it went right straight across their brow ridge, the eye. The third eye was in what the What year was this? Uh, when I had that dream. <laughs> I, I'm not yeah. quite sure. I think it was in 2011, uh, 2012, when I was getting abducted a lot, and these regressed dreams were coming back to me during those years. It had to have been 2011 or 2012. So I got it in my book. I know exactly what date it is, but it was around that era. Yeah. So yeah. I, I saw this three-eyed, and I said, wow. I said that to myself, and they looked at me, and I could see them looking at me, but I didn't see their faces. All I saw was the hood. And then I look down the hallway, and here comes a tall woman, a tall, white uh, alien. I have the drawing in my book. She wore a two-piece. It was a tan two-piece, one you know, covering her top part, the other one like the, kind of like a mini skirt uh, two-piece. And she was about seven feet tall. She had no hair. She had big almond eyes, and, and she was pretty. She was really a, a beautiful woman and she walked up to me and then she looked at me and I saw her face real well. Now that's, that's one that looked me right in the face. That's the only one on that ship that looked me dead in the face. She went over to this panel and it's not dials or lights that they, they do these controls on what they are is they're protrusions from the, from the wall. They look exactly like the wall. They're, they're like stainless steel and they're round. She touches one of them. She disappears. And then she comes back and I look at her and said, wow, how'd you do that? And she grimaced her bottom lip. She just grimaced a little bit. And I've had guys tell me, said, they won't talk to you because you're too stupid. <laughs> it's true. It is. It makes sense. They will not, you know, telepathically, she was telling me what to do, but they're not going to have a conversation with you because we are too stupid compared to them. And so she telepathically told me to follow her. She touched that dial again, and then she walked down this. It was about five feet wide and about nine feet tall. It was a, it was a hallway, stainless steel hallway. She told me to follow her. So when I started following her, she disappeared in front of me, 
And then I followed her and I disappeared and I, I ended up back in my bed and I woke up and I said, Oh my God, what was that all about? And I was just had the adrenaline flowing. I was so, I was so elated or, you know, just fascinated what I was going to say at the beginning, the conclusions, some of the conclusions I found out this was a mothership and this was a Noah's Ark. They planted different life forms on different planets and they were, they were, mixing life forms, putting them together, you know, hybrids, putting them on certain planets with certain environments and certain weather conditions and, and temperatures in order for these animals to survive. So that's what they do. Noah's Ark was not a boat. It was a ship, and they stored DNA. So this tells me that this ship was making life and putting life on other planets. Have you ever heard of the New Jerusalem mothership from 1993? No, I haven't. New Jerusalem. I heard of that, but I haven't heard of the mothership. Yeah, they named the ship after the after the, after the biblical construct. I think you might have been on that ship. Yeah, it seemed like when the first thing come to my, my mind was a Noah's Ark. It was a Noah's Ark ship. It was a life-producing uh, hybridization program. And they showed me the three-eyed baby that this could be somewhere in our future or, our, or on another planet. Uh, but it was interesting that actually, what's that? Can't hear you, you Cass. Can't hear you. Sorry. Do you know that? Do you know your your Bible very well? I know. I know it somewhat. Okay. I know the. The Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, well, the Old Testament I'm interested in uh, because that's where I think ET had a lot of involvement. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, in this case, what um, and this is you know the the listeners can do this at home. I mean, we've all heard the phrase "and the lion shall lie down with the lamb," right? All those posters, you know, throughout history, right? So what it was the funny thing is if you check Ezekiel eleven six, it changes. Every single time there is a, uh, a time ripple or a, what some people call uh, the uh, Mandela effect, right? right? It currently, currently, it says, you know, it's just, uh, a whole bunch of, I want everyone, you read it yourselves, but uh, the last part is a little girl shall lead them. And uh, I think that pertains directly to the child you saw. Are you saying that the Ezekiel chapter that he's got there where he saw the wheel within a wheel he, you said there was a little girl, and it changed. How, the text of the books changes. Yep, you can even it, like check out libraries like three hundred year old Bibles. It changes, you know. And uh, like I said, you guys can do this at home. Check it out. Something about Ezekiel Ezekiel eleven six is sensitive to these temporal changes. So you know, just a little change after here, you know, here and there over the course of the last you know twenty years or so. And so now it's it's gotten completely warped. So it says something completely different, which I think if you give it a read, I, I have a feeling that uh, your psychic brain will go ping. Do you see what I mean? That's that's uh, that is weird. I, so it's not through human interpretation that that changes, but it's through some miraculous thing. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it miraculous, although religious people would call it miraculous. It's just a you know side effect of the Mandela effect. But uh, essentially, yeah, you know, and the old Bibles that were printed hundreds of years ago contain these changes. Right. You know, um, I actually got myself in trouble with my religious family by pointing that out, and they they decided I was the devil. So that was fun. <clears throat> uh, I, but uh, yeah, my wife didn't want me to mess around with writing about God in any of my books. I was, I had a title, a God of Gods. I wanted to t take a look at that. And that's why I was telling you, I wanted to do more studying uh, in, in the biblical history and uh, find the, the Greek, Roman, and also the Egyptian gods in which they, they talk about. It's fascinating. I think the Egyptian uh, whole history is fascinating, but it was, there's a, there's a, a, a book that started it all. And it's, uh, I think they found these books, these, what do they call them? The books that, uh, the, the apocryphy, apocryphy books. Apocrypha. The apocrypha, yeah. Uh, they found other books. And it's just fascinating to, to see a different angle of the Bible and the different characters that that's, that's talked about in the Bible. 
uh, how how they look at them. Uh, I'm trying to think of that one book, and I, I keep forgetting it. I don't know why, but it's it's the one that's got uh, uh, Noah uh, and Abraham and Genesis. And not no, not the book of Genesis. I'm talking about the uh, the book that they did, they didn't put not they did not put in the Bible because it was it was actually uh, yeah. You, you Enoch. Get, Enoch. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the, that's, I've had that book and I want to study it some more to, you know, to kind of correlate or, or you know, find out some answers from, from history to what's going on today with the ET. So Enoch, very interesting. They said that Noah was born. He was tall, white, and he lit up a room with his, his light from his body. And he had, he had piercing blue eyes, blonde hair. He did not look like the Middle Eastern person that you would think would, would, you know, would be. So yeah, there's something about Noah and the ark and the ship. It, it was a, it was a flying ship, one that I was on maybe. Uh, and this, this was a woman I ran into a uh, tall, white, bald headed woman. And uh, yeah, she, <laughs> okay. What's that signal? I was just going to say we we have about five minutes. My Atari six hundred is is melting at this point oh, with the oh. the tape drive is can only hold so much. But no, oh. two hours is about our limit. But I I wanted to um, I didn't mean to stop you guys because you have a great conversation. We could continue this anytime. But um, so Dave, you had mentioned and we're talking about your book. Um, when's it available? You said three weeks can be coming yeah. out, but. Uh, be about three weeks, and it's coming from uh, Hangar One Publishing. Uh, Doug and Alex uh, Hijacek, and they're they're the same guys that produced Monster Quest and other History Channel and Science Channel shows. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug produced a lot of those shows, and so they're very sharp guys. Interesting and coincidence. Why is that? I've been trying to get their attention for a while now. <laughs> Who? Uh, Hangar One. Uh, yeah, uh, you can ask Cam. I've, I've been on this sort of zany mission to contact humanity since before the pandemic. I was actually trying to prevent it. So, but um, you were trying it, to on Monster Quest or, or whatever. Is that oh well, no, not Monster Quest specifically, but like the History Channel. Okay. You know? Yeah. So that's yeah. there's all a whole bunch of details involved in my mission that I was you know trying to get their attention for before everything fell apart. So we 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 were I think we were do for a good pandemic but not particularly this one um, right not you know, for two years we, we couldn't handle anything right. worse so um yeah that's a whole, that's a whole nother episode we've talked about that a little bit but right. so dave emmons you can um you are on facebook and that's how we met like three right maybe four right. years ago i don't know and um so you can catch him there the book's coming out soon and right. um where are we going to find that in on amazon check with the publisher yeah. It'll be on Amazon, and actually, I will market it on uh, Facebook. Uh, so all my all the people who follow me usually, and I'm on the DNN Disclosure News Network uh, channel, and we got a show tomorrow night. Uh, it's going to be seven o'clock Central Time, and it's going to have Yuri Geller on on the show tomorrow night. And so, how is it every Thursday night, Dave? Uh, no, no, it, it's it's when we can get these things produced. Uh, right. My pro my producer is such a perfectionist. He he does things that puts all the bells and whistles in it. He's a great guy. He really is, and he works hard at it. Uh, but sometimes it takes a while to produce, you know, the things that he does. So tomorrow night uh, that show will will air, and uh, I already sent Yuri, uh, you know, a copy of the promo. So it's uh, the promos in the in Facebook now, but. Uh, yeah, I think next week uh, we've got several other shows that we're we're going to you know release in the next week or two, hopefully when when all the production gets done on them. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm a, I have interesting guests, and I uh, I really like talking to people who's had experiences, and because I find out a little bit about my own experiences by talking to others. Exactly. Tom Reed, you've heard of him? The yeah, I know Tom. Yeah. He was talking about a clicking that he, hear, he hears in his ears. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear that too, but I can't tell if the clicking is, is within or if it's outside of your ears. I, it's hard to tell. It's kind of metallic clicking. And I told Thomas, 
Praise <laughs> God. I'm glad you mentioned that. I said, I've had that that happen to me several times. And this is when they're clicking. And, you know, I guess they're they're around you. They're letting you know uh, we're here, you know. I, yeah. yeah, I get a little afraid sometimes, yes. Me too. Me too. Yeah, yeah I did a, a show with Tom Reed called uh, That Night in the Berkshires, which is a beautiful I mean, he, he really liked the show, and it, it went really well. We, I actually interviewed um, him and Jennifer one night, and then we had another guest on another night, and I spliced those together for hours, and it about killed me. And um, it was the only way sometimes that you can do that, and it was it was a lot of fun. So, yeah, uh, yeah Tom Reed's fun. Yeah, Melanie, yeah. Melanie Kirchdorfer. Yeah, they were on my, they were on my show about yeah. two months ago. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're cool. And uh, Melanie's super nice, and it was great to talk to her. So, and Dave, tonight it's been great to talk to you. Um, we got to go. I got editing to do, and got to tuck Cassidy in to bed because um, he's not allowed to stay up after nine p.m. So, um, okay. I'm too little. Yeah, all right. He's, he's just but a little, little six uh, seven guy. Yeah, well, you know, everybody just uh, look for my book in about three weeks. Uh, Anger wait. One Publishing. I would love a copy. I would love an advanced copy if you can get me that. Yeah. And we'll oh. talk about it and promote it for you. So yeah. that's Dave Emmons. And uh, Dave, thank you so much. And looking forward to reading the book and hearing more from Dave Emmons. Um, thank you. And, and give us just one more word before you go, Dave. I would like to say for those people who don't believe that these things happen, believe me, they do happen. And I've seen so many things happen to me. And people around me have seen things. My neighbors have seen lights in my backyard. They've heard ships in their backyard. And these people are not telling me for a whole month because they don't want to scare me. And they tell me, and my mom and my sister and my brother-in-law saw a man in black in the field behind my house, tall guy in a long black coat with the wind blowing. So it's not just me. And if people pay attention to what's going on around them, they can see things too, just like I do. Pay attention to the energy that's around you. Pay attention to your environment. Pay attention to people around you. Uh, some people can pick out dangers. I can do that since I was in combat. I know how to pick out danger. When I see somebody that looks dangerous, I stay clear of them. And so we all have that innate ability. A lot of us do anyway. But also notice people that are different and, and maybe strange. They may not be psychos. They may be ETs. So that's true. Pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, know your surroundings and look, look because they're out there. I always tell people, don't just look at night; look in the daytime too. So yes, yes. yeah. So again, thanks again, Dave Emmons, for being on the show, and you, Cast. Thank you so much. I love your input. I love your insight. I did too. um, With that, I would like to say good night to everybody, and we will talk again someday in the future. All right. Thank you, Cast and Cam. Thank you. Good night, boys. Bye. Thank you. You can find my website at www.myalienlifepodcast.com and please subscribe to my latest downloads at iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and at podbean.com. And please follow me and like me on Facebook and Twitter. My Alien Life is written and produced for broadcast at Studio 254 in the Northern Rocky Mountains. The music you are hearing is produced and created by Elion. You can find all Elion's work online at Heart Dance Records. 